for second order cone programming. Okay, so I'm going to speak about uh, quantum algorithms for second order cone programming. And We should um, begin by defining what second order cones are and, and how this class of uh, second order cone programming is intermediate between uh, linear and semi-definite programs, but it's still distinct from both. So the second order cones are also known as the Lorentz cones. And let's begin with uh, the definition of the Lorentz cone. So the n-dimensional Lorentz cone is defined um, as a set of vectors in Rn where the size of the first coordinate, x0, is bigger than the norm of all the other coordinates. So here's a picture from uh, the Wikipedia which shows the Lorentz cone for three dimensions. Okay, let me uh, try to adjust these slides a bit. So, uh, so this is a picture of L3, which is uh, the set of all points x, y, z, so that uh, z squared is bigger than x squared plus y squared. And also let's uh, look at L1, which is simply um, all the positive uh, points in R, which is simply R plus. So a second order cone program is an optimization problem where the constraints of the form uh, vector x belongs to some Lorentz cone, Ln. So let's give a formal definition of SOCP. So, um, so in, in its general form, it's an optimization problem over a product of uh, Lorentz cones. So I'll write the more compact description shortly in the next slide, but let's see a more expanded description. So, so it's minimizing a linear function where you can think of these components as lying in different Lorentz cones. So it's C1 transpose X1, C2 transpose X2, and so on. And then uh, there are linear constraints. Uh, um, constraint matrices AI, which belong to Rm times Ni for I and R. And, uh, and the conic constraints are that each Xi belongs to these Lorentz cones. So, uh, so the two important parameters characterizing the size of this problem, in, in terms of which the running times will be given, are the rank and the dimension. So, so the rank of the SOCP is the number of Lorentz constra uh, constraints. So it's the number of Lorentz cones uh, involved in, the, in, in this problem definition. And the dimension is the sum of the dimensions of all the vectors. So n is the sum of ni, and r is the number of uh, Lorentz cones. So the running times of all algorithms will be given in terms of uh, r, n, and uh, uh, the duality gap, or how close you, the solutions are to the optimal. So more compactly, it can be written as an optimization problem over the product of Lorentz cones. And in this form, it'll look very similar to linear and semi-definite programs. So here is a standard form of the primal and dual uh, SOCP. So this is obtained by concatenating all the Cs and the Xs on the last slide. So, so, so now the problem is to minimize C transpose X, uh, where AX is equal to B. And x belongs to L, where L is the product of all these Lorentz cones. And similarly, one can write the dual, and one sees that it's formally very similar to um, SDP or uh, LP in, in the standard form. So SOCP is generalized linear programs, first of all, because as we saw on the first slide, L1 is the set of positive uh, real numbers. So by um, uh, adding constraints uh, in the Lorentz cone L1, we can replicate LP constraints. And it also generalizes convex QPs, which we'll see in the next slide, as we see examples of problems that can be formulated as SOCPs. And the running time of these algorithms, as I said before, will be given in terms of n, r, and the duality gap, epsilon. So one of the most important uh, problems that reduces to SOCPs is the support vector machine problem in uh, machine learning. So let me uh, say what this problem is and how it reduces to the uh, SOCP briefly. So the SVMs are one of the most important classification algorithms in machine learning. So the input to the SVM is, uh, is a training set of vectors xi, which are the data points, and the labels yi. 
So the SVM is formulated as a convex QP, where uh, the objective function is um, to minimize this weight vector plus a regularization term. And we have constraints that uh, each, uh, that each vector in the training set is being classified properly. So, so in other words, um, W transpose X is a good uh, classifier for the training set. So there should be no WI, but yeah. So, so the constraints of YI, W transpose XI plus B are bigger than one minus uh, zeta I. So, uh, so we are imposing the constraint that all these uh, points are being separated by a wide margin hyperplane. So the zeta is a penalizing how, um, how much you violate the constraints. So, so you have a L1 regularization in terms of the zeta and this is the formulation of uh, SVMs, uh, which is the standard formulation used in machine learning applications. So, so now uh, let's see quickly how to uh, write uh, the quadratic constraint as linear constraint over the Lorentz cone. So that would show us how to represent the SVM problem as SOCP. So we introduce a new uh, vector, uh, t plus 1, t, uh, w, and, um, um, and impose the constraint that it belongs to Lorentz n plus 2. So this constraint means that t plus 1 squared is bigger than t squared plus w squared. So when you uh, cancel out the uh, quadratic terms, you're left with 2t plus 1 bigger than uh, norm of w squared. So now you can change the objective function to, uh, to, optimize, uh, to minimize t instead of w squared. And the t plus 1 tw is a linear constraint. It's saying that uh, x2 minus x1 is equal to 1. So, so this quadratic program has been reduced to an SOCP, which is um, conic constraints plus linear constraints. So we uh, reduced it without losing much in the dimension. Uh, so we reduced it uh, to an SCP with uh, variable in L n plus 2 and, um, and the zeta i, which are supposed to be positive, so they are all in L1. And the rank is n plus n plus 2, where m is the size of the training set, n is the dimension. So, so uh, convex quadratic programs can be seen as one of the most important classes of applications for the SOCP. So now uh, I can state uh, our main results. So the, main, um, so the best uh, classical SOCP algorithm is based on interior point methods. And it, it's uh, given by Bental and Nemirovsky. And it has running time square root r, n omega, log n over epsilon. So omega is the exponent for matrix multiplication. Um, in practice, we'll see that it's, it's, um, um, it's more than cubic, the exponents for these uh, SOCP solvers. So, um, so in this work, we develop a quantum uh, interior point method for SOCPs. And the running time of this quantum IPM is n1.5 square root r plus uh, some other quantum specific factors, um, which are the condition number and the distance of the intermediate solutions from the cone boundary, which I write as kappa over delta squared times log 1 over epsilon. And um, uh, apart from this theoretical result, we, uh, we, um, um, uh, we have some experimental results on random SVM instances. So I'll define what these random instances are later. So the so, uh, so, if, so empirically, we find that the, uh, the quantum algorithm scales as order n to the k, where k belongs to 2.56 to 2.62 with high probability. And the external SOCP solvers uh, scales as n 3.31. So, so that can be seen as some evidence of uh, polynomial speed up on uh, the quadratic programs in SOCPs. But can I ask a question? So, but in theory, it, uh, the, the classical one is better. So, uh, in theory, if you look at the exponents of n, it is um, um, like omega is like one point. Uh, omega is two point three seven in theory. Okay. So now I'll try to explain to you why SOCPs are. Um, an important problem in their own right, like this, uh, the lie between uh, linear and semi-definite programs. And uh, I'll also talk a bit about Jordan algebras, which are used heavily in the analysis of um, SOCP IPMs. So Jordan algebras came from some uh, problem in the foundations of quantum mechanics. And formally, they can be defined as uh, an algebra satisfying these three axioms. So um, it's a non-associative algebra, which is commutative, which is power associative, and which is formally real, meaning that uh, if the sum of squares is zero, each of the terms has to be zero. So, 
So Jordan von Neumann and Wigner classified all finite dimensional formally real Jordan algebras into five families. So three of these families came from, uh, from matrix algebras. So, so one of the most important examples of Jordan algebras is uh, matrix algebra with the product defined as xy plus yx by two. But there were two other families and one of them was uh, the spin factor, which, which has this rather strange Jordan product. So, um, so the Jordan product here is, um, is defined in this equation. So, so it is splitting the vector into one coordinate and the rest. And then the first coordinate is uh, uh, the inner product of the vectors and the second is a symmetrized version of the rest. Appropriately added. And uh, the identity element for this operation is one, uh, zero, n. And, and it is this Jordan algebra that will be heavily used in the analysis of the SOCP interior point method. So this Jordan product is a linear operation. It, in particular, it has a matrix representation. So if I write the Jordan product as a matrix, I get these arrow matrices. So, so it's a matrix which has uh, U on the columns, on the first column, U on the first row, and on the diagonal. So it, it's shaped like an arrow. So the Jordan product u uh, dot v can be written as arrow w, arrow u times uh, the vector v. <coughs> and similarly, one can extend these Jordan products blockwise. So if I have a, um, a product of Lorentz cones, I can define the Jordan product component-wise. And these well-structured arrow matrices somehow make the linear systems that arise in the interior point methods much simpler. Like, um, and the construction of the corresponding block encodings for the quantum interior point method much simpler than the STP case, let's see. So now, um, so now I'll say something about the interior point method and how you analyze it in terms of these Jordan algebras. So the central path for the SOCP and also for STPs and LPs is parameterized by feasibility and complementary slackness conditions. So the first two conditions are feasibility for the primal and the dual problems. And the last condition is a version of the complementary slackness condition. So it can be written in terms of the Jordan product for the SOCP. If I was writing it for the STPs, it would simply be X uh, times as, as, as matrix product uh, is new times identity. And the central path converges towards the optimal solution as new tends to zero. So the complementary slackness conditions for optimality say that X dot S is zero. So the main idea for the interior point method is to start with some value of nu and then find increments, uh, delta x, delta y, and delta s, so that the updated solutions are close to the central path for a smaller value of uh, uh, nu prime. And this factor sigma is like one minus one by square root n or one minus one by square root r for the SOCP case, and that's why you need a certain number of iterations for this IPM to converge. So what are the linear systems that one needs to solve to uh, make this iterative improvement? So, so they're obtained by linearizing the last equation, which was given in terms of the Jordan product, and neglecting the uh, quadratic term. So if I uh, linearize it and neglect the quadratic term, I uh, arrive at this Newton system. And we can see that for the SOCP, this system is rather simple. Like it just has the input matrices A and A transpose, and these arrow matrices, which uh, can be constructed directly from the uh, solutions S and X that. <coughs> and the analysis of the IPM uh, in the classical case uh, shows that uh, if X, Y, S is, a neighborhood, is in the neighborhood of the central path, then the updated solution remains in the neighborhood of the central path. So the quantum IPM is a bit different. Like we don't solve these linear systems exactly, but we apply a quantum linear system solver and then uh, do tomography to recover approximate solutions. And therefore, one needs to give an approximate analysis, which shows the same statement with respect to approximations. So, so the basic idea for the quantum IPM is simple. Like one uh, uses the quantum linear system solvers instead of the classical linear system solvers. And one needs to write uh, down the next system. So after having solved this linear system, one uh, does tomography to recover um, the solution to the system, and that's used to construct the next linear system. 
So the main uh, tools that go into, the main quantum tools that go into this um, are quantum data structures, which allow us to do uh, efficient uh, unitary block encodings for, uh, for the linear system matrices. And then uh, the quantum linear system solvers, the state of the art results are by Chakravarti, Gillian, Jeffrey, and more recent work by Gillian and others. So given block encodings for the input matrix, the quantum linear system can be solved in uh, inverse case time, square root n, kappa, log one of epsilon, kappa being the condition number. And then uh, there is this fast tomography procedure, which we um, developed for um, STP and data point methods. And that says that the output of a quantum linear system solver can be deconstructed in time log n over epsilon squared. So, so the time is n log n over epsilon squared for um, L2 norm guarantees, like the ones we use here, to get x hat minus x less than epsilon in x2, and log n over epsilon squared for the L infinity guarantees. So these are the basic quantum tools that we'll be using, and I'll not delve too much into them because it's already been talked about. So the analysis of the uh, quantum interior point method uh, for the SOCP is basically done using this Jordan algebras, which is also provides a unified analysis in the classical setting for STPs and SOCPs. So, so the interesting part is that um, like, uh, like the spectral decomposition for matrices, one can uh, have a spectral decomposition using the Jordan algebra where there are exactly two eigenvectors and this applies to um, the vectors in the Lorentz cone. So the, the Lorentz cone serves uh, as the cone of the vectors which have all the eigenvalues positive. And we can define analogs for all the matrix quantities like the spectral norm, which is larger of the two eigenvalues and the Frobenius norm, which is the sum of squares of the two eigenvalues. And we can even find analogs of the familiar inequalities like uh, x y Frobenius is less than x spectral times y Frobenius. And similarly, like uh, for the analysis, one has to find analogs of all the matrix uh, quantities that one uses in the STP analysis. So, uh, so for example, in the STP analysis, one uses a matrix scaling, y goes to x, y, x, and this has a Jordan algebra analog of two arrow squared x minus arrow x squared. So by making this dictionary, one can translate the approximate uh, IPM analysis for the STPs to the SOCP setting and get similar results. Okay, so now I'll uh, talk about the experiments and uh, <coughs> um, what kind of speed ups one can hope to get out of these um, interior point, quantum interior point methods for SOCPs. So the experiments we carried out were on random SVM instances. So I'm going to define what a random SVM instance is on this slide. So, so first we generate the data points. So we generate M of these points from the unit hypercube uniformly at random. And then we generate a random uh, um, um, vector in Rn, which is supposed to classify these points. And the labels are signed as yi as uh, the sign of W transpose xi. Then we uh, corrupt a fixed pr fix proportion of the label so that the data set is not exactly classifiable and shifted by a normal distribution. And we perform this experiment over a wide range of values, like this distribution, let's call it SVM n to np. Let's fix m to be linear in n. And uh, P is uniform from uh, 0 to 1 in multiples of 0.1, and N is uniform in 2 to 2 to the 9. So, so that's the definition of a random SVM. So we went for this because we wanted to have an unstructured data set where no algorithm could be using some structure of the data to get an advantage. What is the margin of the structured data set? So it depends on uh, this fixed proportion P that you are corrupting. So, we, uh, so the first observation is that you don't need to solve the SOCP to very high accuracy to get good classification results. So, uh, so even a modest precision like epsilon equal to 0.1 is good enough to get high accuracy results for the SVM. And that's good for the quantum algorithm because one does tomography and um, incurs uh, one over epsilon square penalty for, for the precision. So, so the comparisons we made were with the classical SOCP solver, the ECOS, and the lib SVM with linear kernel. So we found that for these instances, uh, on the last slide, the um, ECOS solver scales empirically as N3.314. And this is more or less uh, consistent with using a Stratson-like matrix <coughs> multiplication algorithm with exponent 2.8. Uh, 
And the lib SVM scale set uh, is better. It's uh, N3.112. It's consistent with alternate uh, approaches to SVM. Like one doesn't have to solve the SOCP to do the SVM. There are other techniques for it. And then we um, uh, look at the scaling of this quantum running time, which is N squared kappa over delta squared. And, and we uh, find a 95% uh, confidence interval in the range 2.56, 2.62. And also, it's important to see that the uh, classification accuracy of the quantum and classical algorithms are very similar. So this is a plot of the classification accuracies on the training and test sets. So, so the blue and the yellow lines are the ones which compare it to the classical SOCP solver. So as we can see, the accuracies are very close for, because they're basically using the same algorithm. Uh, and the red and the purple lines are the ones which compare against the libSVM. So the algorithm is different. So we see a wider gap, but it's still uh, quite comparable in performance to the, to the classical algorithms in terms of accuracy. So, so the experiments that we can make, like it's of course a difficult task to benchmark QML algorithms or quantum optimization algorithms in the... Yes, so it's a uh, graph of the empirical CDF between the SVM accuracy differences for the uh, two algorithms. Which is the classical one here? I'm just so it's a difference between the uh, quantum minus the classical accuracy difference. So. So the ideal plot would look like um, one which goes to zero and uh, then rises to one. So, um, so we find some experimental support for the idea that the quantum IPM achieves a polynomial speed up for SOCPs with low and medium precision requirements. And for random uh, SVM instances, it seems to get a polynomial speed up with some exponent. And we obtained similar results for another instance of the SOCP, which is the portfolio optimization problem. So I have a few slides on it if uh, time permits, but, but the results are very much similar. So it's not something radically different. And uh, and the conclusion I'd like to make is that quantum optimization methods can achieve polynomial speedups for the longer term algorithms. And, and the main open question with regard to quantum integer point methods is, um, is what one can get if one replaces the quantum tomography with the weaker L infinity norm guarantees. So this would speed the quantum algorithm up by quite a lot, but one needs to carry out classical analysis to, to establish such a method. So there's some hope that uh, this might work because recent uh, classical LP algorithms uh, do such uh, kinds of analysis. Okay, so I'd like to conclude there unless I have time to go over the portfolio optimization. So maybe, maybe we'll stop here. Sorry, Looks like this quantum interpret method mainly is like you got precision for low and medium precision. Yours is like for interpret methods, it's known as you. Yes, so for the classical interior point methods, uh, the scaling and precision is log 1 over epsilon. But for the quantum interior point method, we don't solve the linear systems exactly. We, we solve them only to low precision because quantum tomography scales as 1 over epsilon squared. So that's the. As you optimize solution, Usually, if your optimal solution is on boundary, as you um, run it from the interior point, go to the boundary, the condition, the matrix becomes uh, very, very bad. Yes. Uh, so that's why we estimated these condition numbers empirically for the, um, for the SVM problem, for example. And we found that they were reasonably well behaved. Like the scaling is not arbitrarily bad, it's only like one over epsilon bad. Where epsilon is in one I'm wondering if you could compare some of your work to some of the earlier talks. 
because there were alternative approaches that would... So there's, of course, alternative multiplicative rates-based approach to quantum STP solving. And, um, and they, defend, they depend on different parameters, but they are also in the low uh, accuracy regime. Like, um, they have a epsilon dependence, which make them inapplicable to very high uh, precision solutions. I, I couldn't hear the end of your sentence, and I was interested in it. So, um, so the other methods are using the matrix multiplicative weights uh, methods. Like we heard some of, about some of them on the previous talk. And, um, and they have a strong epsilon dependence as well. Like they scale as one over epsilon squared or, or worse. So they, so, so they are also not applicable to the high precision regime. And they depend on different parameters, not on the condition number, but on the width of these uh, multiplicative uh, Any more questions? Well, then, thank the speaker again.